We are unprepared for the danger our future holds. We face floods, wildfires, extreme weather, crop failure, mass displacement and the breakdown of society. The time for denial is over. It is time to act. This project comes from an overwhelming feeling of helplessness as we see our planet descend into crisis. As stated by Extinction Rebellion, the government is not listening or acting and it is time to take matters into our own hands. Here to Utopia imagines the conversion of a decommissioned gas works silo into an alternative housing development led by Extinction Rebellion to present a self-sufficient, part community build neighbourhood. The project aims to locally address issues surrounding the climate emergency by empowering and recognising as individuals we can make a difference. The project explores the theme of sustainability by developing the following concepts. Repurposing discarded items, implementing self-sustainable technologies and creating a community that shares. The proposal is located in Kensal Rise, London. Due to the previous industrial use, the site is contaminated. As an architectural response, nothing will touch the landscape. Two skeletal frames of the gasometers remain on site and are converted to support the development. Pathways are carved through the land and scattered above, yet neither disrupt the landscape. The ground floor is mixed use for events and markets. The centre of the silo becomes an atrium with a continuous step ramp that draws people through the void space. Pods are suspended, serving as a natural gas holder and an auditorium for events. Houses, greenhouses and offices are suspended on the outside of the silo. Workshops directly below allow for these structures to be customised and assembled on site and hoisted into place. The architecture might slowly start to grow as the community does, starting from the top and being built down. The silo was a point of interest due to its monumental structure that is symbolic of the Industrial Revolution, a turning point for environmental decline. Its conversion to a sustainable community symbolises Exile's vision to mend the wrongs of the past and rejuvenate the land. The silos are embedded within British culture, widely written about, portrayed in art, and even set as a backdrop for British pop culture television. They've become part of the urban fabric, and residents reminisce on how the gas works intertwined with their lives. It was important to reuse the silo, as the project explores ideas of repurposing. Offering itself as a superstructure, architectural elements are suspended from it and hoisted into place. It should be noted that there are many of these unused silos around the UK, creating a network of potential sites. The silo may become a symbol for the Extinction Rebellion housing movement. Relating to the brief of walking, I set out on a treasure hunt, collecting discarded items. I taxonified them and began to assemble them within the site, curious to see what accidental spatial properties arise from the unmethodical assemblage of random items. I was interested in the plurality behind this, how many diverse elements can come together to form a new identity. This was developed in several other projects throughout the semester. The concept was also present in an anti-consumerist group of artists I interviewed called the Mutoids. They transformed an abandoned quarry into a community made out of scrapped items as a commentary on the consumerist society that they aimed to reject. The buildings are never finished, constructed, deconstructed and reused. Their life cycle? Continuous. The community allows for adaption and change over time, spatially and through materiality. Located in an industrial precinct, Many recycling companies surround the site. Housing units could take on different found materials and be customised by each inhabitant, while public space becomes a platform for Exile to voice themselves through art, rituals and events. One example of repurposing are the cores. Found items are cast into plaster, documenting items people have left behind and memorialising the lasting lives of objects beyond their fleeting human use. The colours of the items attract wildlife, while the form creates shelter for insects to inhabit and plants to grow on. The cores can be thought of as totems, an emblem of the group's ethos to rejuvenate and heal the wrongs of the past. Growth over time is symbolic of the successful revival of the land. The idea of constant adaption relates to utopian theorist Elizabeth Groh's concept that realised utopias are not ideal but real places where daily practice consists of finding ways in which people can collaborate, reassess and strive for something better. Therefore, designing for change is essential, as it encourages unrealised possibilities that cannot be planned for. There was also a desire to achieve a translucency, blurring the dominant and commanding steel silo. This was inspired by photography collection by British artist Idris Khan. 
He overlay photograph of British gas holder compressing both time and space until a blurred, composite, ghostly shadow structure emerges. Like Khan, I take the technique of relentless layering to create complexity. At a distance, the facades seem to fuse to compose a united identity. But through closer inspection, the unique qualities of each element is evident, relating back to the idea of plurality. Grasshopper serves as an integral part to testing the idea of repetition. Earlier iterations use rules to compose components. The pods are also made up of many small, individual 3D printed components, assembled to create a web-like structure within the atrium. Much like Khan's images, the cellar begins to blur as the program is interwoven around it, losing their commanding simplicity and rigid formalism. Several programs were used to create a time-based architecture. A cloth simulation in Maya creates the rise and fall of the pods, and growth simulations for visualising plant growth in the atrium. Real-time rendering in Unreal Engine allowed for animations to take fruition, and also allowed for a VR experience, meaning I could inhabit the architecture at a one-to-one -one scale, which contributed to the design and feedback process. Being a circular building, aspect was taken into consideration. Greenhouses face south, while their form allows for light to penetrate all walls. Houses face north, being built up against each other, with thicker insulation on shared walls. Offices occupy areas with the least sunlight, generating heat through their programmatic use and utilising diffuse light. The general mass is dictated by trying to let light into the atrium, which is measured using a radiance simulator on Ladybug. All units hang on the outside of the silo, suspended from the top and connecting to the structure via a ring beam. The house's slim, elongated form is inspired by the narrowboat flipped vertically. Narrow spaces with stairs that fall between levels create a void space throughout. I had the opportunity to interview Simon, a proud canal boat owner. For him, boat life meant decluttering, reconnecting with wildlife, and becoming part of a community which was not common for London suburbs. For these reasons, there was an intention to integrate the canal culture into the community. Environmental implications of living smaller also include reduced construction material, taking less energy to power the house, and reducing material possessions. The programmatic organisation of the housing units utilise a stacked effect. For example, the rising heat from the kitchen and bathroom penetrate the dwelling spaces above. Several passive house techniques are also used to reduce operational carbon, such as reducing the AV volume by building houses beside one another, and reducing thermal bridges, for example by detaching the balconies. The facades of the units are also layered with kinetic shading devices that open and close based on the thermal gain needed, determined by a simulation derived from Ladybug. The silo once supplied electricity to the surrounding town. It will continue to supply the community with energy using sustainable technologies. Firstly, the continuous step ram stores kinetic energy from walking and converts it into usable electricity. The continuous path turns a void space into a spatial continuity. The ramp acts as an interior boulevard that exposes and connects all programmatic elements in a continuous sequence. As you ascend, the architecture unfolds and reveals itself to the spectator. Suspended within the atrium are also large ETFE pods. One encloses an auditorium, while the others rise and fall as natural gas is pumped into them. Natural gas is produced via an anaerobic digester that converts food, human and plant waste into natural gas and fertiliser, which can be turned into electricity. The rise and fall of the pods is reminiscent of the former gas chamber. In British literature, the gas chamber was often personified, compared to a lung or the beating of a human heart. The soft body of the pod contrasts the rigid steel container it replaces. The rise and fall reflects the community's vitality and marks the rhythm of time. Water consumption also plays a large part in the circular economy of the community. Greenhouses are supported by an aquaponic system, and rebeds filter grey water for reuse. Bio and phytoremediation will be used to decontaminate the site, lasting approximately six years. Afterwards, the site will be planted with endangered wildflower to encourage biodiversity. I was inspired by French architect Gilles Clement, who removed nature from human impact so it could develop organically and spontaneously. Research has showed this has the potential to increase and strengthen biodiversity. Above ground, a path has been suspended within the trees, so habitants can spectate the rejuvenation of the land. 
Paths below ground, made of rammed earth, allow you to see the plants but not touch them. The final film compresses the layers of time. It captures the revival of an empty relic into a bustling neighbourhood, from conception to realisation. I hope you enjoy. (laughs) 